Joseph and Carver be known. Ms. Joseph and Carver is from Gen 3 in Asheville, North Carolina. He's done a lot of work um, with uh, all over the country, um, you know, Buffalo, New York, Durango, Colorado, Laramie, Wyoming, uh, but also here in Tennessee, in Chattanooga and Nashville. He was the keynote speaker for the Power of Ten conference in 2014, just down the street. Um, and uh, I've been following his stuff uh, pretty regularly for several years now. Um, so with that, um, this is Joseph. Good evening, everyone. Um, some of y'all have seen seen our work before, and uh, some of you all haven't. But I'm just going to do a quick little introduction of, of who I am and where I'm from. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the way that I see cities. And cities are places in time. Um, they have a start, and then they have a, a trajectory, much in the way that I have a start. So this is how I started life when I was three months old and I had hair. Um, and this is my trajectory, right? So I'm going to be Papa, whether I like it or not. Um, or more importantly, I look at this guy, my dad. So I see traits in my father coming on to me, and I see myself, the good traits and bad traits, and trying to deal with them. So we've got two, two genetic, genetic issues in my family. I'm genetically Italian. There's not a lot I can do to change that. Um, but we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. So there's things that I do as markers and tracks that I do to try to avoid those those mistakes or those those issues in the future, right? So I eat salad, I exercise, get to, get my stress level down. I have to do that because I want to avoid having heart surgery, basically. So, as you all think about your 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 trajectory as a city, what's your marker? Who is who is your city that you're looking at and seeing good habits and bad habits? I'm going to go through some of the examples that I think I see in you all, but it's just it's just the way that I tend to look at cities. These aren't. You're not in a unique situation. Everybody's got similar traits and issues. Um, so Asheville, we're up in the mountains. Um, beautiful setting, uh, bluegrass music, beer. We've got we're we're 90,000 people. We have 40 breweries, um, which is kind of insane. Um, and like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little quirky town, right? <laughs> it didn't start that way. This is a shot down. Uh, Main Street in the 1800s. If y'all have been to Asheville, you've probably stood right at this location. Um, 20 years after this picture was taken, this is what Asheville became. We like to say the three T's made Asheville. Trains, tourism, and tuber tuberculosis. That once the train lines came there, it brought a flood of tourists um, into the city. Um, second streetcar line in the entire country. Presidents used to come to visit. We've had Obama three times, so presidents still visit. Um, but what's, what a lot of people don't realize about Asheville, in the 1920s, we were growing at 20% in population every single year of that decade, which is explosive growth. We became the second largest city in North Carolina. Did you all realize we were actually the second largest? The only city that was bigger than us was Winston-Salem. So um, in that process, we achieved the highest debt per capita of the entire United States. We were number one in debt. Um, when the, when their, our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank little clerical error there in our accounting. Um, our city council was indicted and the mayor committed suicide. That's how we entered the Depression. Um, Thomas Wolfe, famous American author, wrote the book Look Homeward Angel. In the book, he wrote this about his hometown. Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They've flung away the earnings of a lifetime. They've mortgaged those of, gener of a generation to come. They have ruined a city, and in doing so, they've ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. There's some really kind words to say about your hometown, right? Um, incidentally, he was threatened. His parents were threatened. Um, he stayed up in New York City. He wrote a second book, which was called You Can't Go Home Again, for obvious reasons. Um, but in a way, he was calling out our community, but he was, he was talking about what would happen in the future due to this, this problem. Um, it would take us until 1976 to pay off that debt. So when you talk about credit rating, bond rating, all that stuff, Asheville was flat on its face uh, because we had all this debt on the books. Now, it was also very fiscally prudent that they chose to pay it off rather than get a bailout or anything else. And it's one of the un little un the less talked about success parts of Asheville. And it's also the reason why we have what we have. We were essentially too poor to tear our buildings down. Um, incidentally, check this out. This is the newspaper from 1976. It didn't even get the lead story. Even though we've got, you know, these, these three guys burning the bond, we've got Miss Asheville with their tiara, uh, you know, they teleprompter and Billy Graham, it's a big deal and Billy shows up. But somebody dying in a prison fire in some other neighboring county got the lead story that day. So we still had this, like, very self-conscious issue about it. 
When we got out of that debt, we started doing what other cities did. We cut a highway through the north side of downtown, which became the Crosstown Expressway. And the coup de grace was when we blew the mountain open. This is Bowcatcher Cut in the Bowcatcher Mountain. Um, apparently, DOT didn't have the technology to build a tunnel. The community wanted a, tun a tunnel. Uh, even though some lost civilization of humanoids left us a tunnel right here, um, <laughs> we got this cut. On the other side of the cut, the mall happened and our downtown died. So when you all come to Asheville and you see a successful town, what we see is this memory of this place with boarded up buildings. We have this still present to us. This is a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there. You know, look at this lovely fixer-upper opportunity right here. Would y'all want to put some elbow grease into that? So. When I come to your downtown, I see the same memory here. You have these buildings that are boarded up that you got have to you can uncork, right? So, but like a Greek choir, anytime somebody tried to fix these buildings downtown, those children's children would stand up and say, "That won't work here. That's not who we are. We're not we're not uh, Boston or or Portland, Oregon. We're not city people. We're rural mountain people. That's who we are." Um, the, our parent company was started by this guy, Julian Price, who moved to Asheville and started a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. Uh, what we did is, is rehab, we fixed buildings. Julian in, essentially <coughs> took his inheritance and started a real estate development company with 75% of the money going into sticks and bricks, and then we'd use 25% of the money to seed businesses. So the first vegetarian restaurant that the bank said would never work right here, that's the laughing seed. Um, we put them in business, and they've basically been a success story ever since. Asheville is now one of the top 10 vegetarian cities in the entire country. So it's about knowing our community and knowing these opportunities that exist, but also cultivating local business uh, growth in our community. But we do typical stuff, like take this building from this situation to this situation. It's just your typical rehab. It was about getting people living downtown. Uh, this goes back to Jane Jacobs, where if you put people downtown, that's how you get your downtown successful. Um, and the first easiest way to put them there is to give them a living opportunity. Um, Julian also had a magazine, so we're always doing community outreach and talking to citizens. Um, this is, I love this, among cities with no particular recreation appeal, those that have preserved their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't received almost no tourism at all, tourism simply doesn't go to a city that's lost its soul. Fifteen years after he published this, this is a quote from Arthur Frommer. Uh, Frommer's Magazine listed Asheville as the number five place in the country to visit. Um, two years ago, we got listed number one. I think last year we had about nine million tourists come through town. We're 90,000 people. You know, it's, and we can't support all those breweries or the 75 restaurants, so thank you all for visiting my community and leaving your money behind. That's awesome. Um, but what we find is that you have to raise the conversation to a point around data. Can you understand the data of what's happening in your city and why does it matter? to have a, a conversation about that. So this is what was going on with Asheville. Just by fixing up those upper stories in those buildings, that real estate value was already there. This is the value of our downtown from 1991 to 2007. So that value was essentially uncorked in buildings that were already sitting there. We decided to polish them and use them and get them active again. Um, to show you that it's not all love and roses in Asheville, this is a political ad um, from 1992. This guy, Chris Peterson. Um, so he's all upset about council's investment, um, $26 million into downtown infrastructure for streets, parking decks, and stuff like that, right? I don't have $26 million. That's a lot of money. So let's talk about this for a second. If you invest $26 million on a $100 million asset, and that $100 million asset grows to $500 million, is investing 26 and seeing a $400 million private sector return, is that a good return on investment? Yeah. yeah. So let's just put the numbers out there and talk about that. So <clears throat> let me just skip through this for a second. It's a kid's book. Um, so when we talk about the city, we talk about it for what it is. Um, it's a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. What you can control and what you provide <coughs> infrastructure to is how you make your city work. Um, it's, it's, it's a corporation, right? So you've got a charter, you've got a board of directors, you have to manage this corporation. So if you look up the word incorporate, it even says that, to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. In, in Asheville, there's really no difference between our development corporation, which is a $15 million business, and my city, which is another corporation. It's got costs and revenues, right? But the difference is the scale. My city is a 
$1.5 billion real estate development corporation. We happen to elect a board of directors. The mayor is the uh, chair of the board of directors, and we have a CEO that we pay, right? That's, that's how our business operates. So Asheville, uh, to quote Ted Turner, if life is a game, money is how we keep score, Asheville is six times the value of this guy. Does my council think of decisions at Asheville's level at the same level way that Ted Turner's thinking about uh, an economic decision at CNN? Um, so if we look at the buildings as products, they're essentially crops in the city. Um, this is one of our buildings that we rehabbed. Here's the streetscape project that Chris got upset about. Uh, so we got a bike rack, a bench, two benches, a street tree. In, in Chris's mind, that was a subsidy at our front door. We didn't pay for that sidewalk. So that's, that's fair for him to say that. But we took this building's value by doing retail, office, and residential. We took it from $300,000 to $11 million of taxable value. So my community now got 3,500% more taxes on this property than it had before. It's not money that we have. It's money that you all have to go out and buy 3,000 more garbage cans. I don't care. You know, it's that, it's that return on, on the investment. So do you all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, so this is, this is the return on that investment. And people say to me, they're like, well, Joe, that's fine. That's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here at $20 million, which is sizable. It's more than our building. Walmart, that Walmart pays $220,000 in property taxes, which is massive. Um, this is our building. This is my house. These are my dogs. My, my dogs think they're lions. They're a little weird. But um, we pay $2,000 in taxes. We're on a tenth of an acre. So if a one-acre cookie cutter fell from space and hit my neighborhood, it grabbed 10 houses, each paying two, about 2000 bucks, right? Or about $20,000 an acre in taxes. Did y'all follow me with this? If you take that one-acre cookie cutter up, fly it in space, drop it on the Walmart, divide the Walmart tax bill by its 34 acres that it's sitting on, this is the tax yield per acre. And if you had an acre of our building, this is what you get. So we're trying, when I'm trying to get you into the mindset of the way that farmers think of real estate. Farmers look at it as an economic puzzle, and it all starts with the land is the least common denominator. What's the crop yield per acre, the water per acre, the fertilizer per acre, the labor per acre, and what does it yield in the marketplace uh, as, as a function of its crop yield? So if we're looking at buildings the same way, I was just presenting this in Colorado two weeks ago, and I said, okay, got an acre of land in Colorado, what are you going to grow? They got the joke. You know, you go for the cash crop, right? <laughs> so people say, well, Joe, that's not fair. In Colorado, the cities are run almost, you hold wholly off the retail taxes. Retail taxes are super important in Colorado, so they're like, what about the retail taxes? So let's get rid of me because I don't sell anything, and let's compare these two buildings. Now, again, we've got retail on the ground floor. <laughs> the misnomer is, again, we get stuck on that big number. Walmart sells about $77 million worth of product, um, but the city only gets a portion of a portion of that. So my city gets 27% of the eight cents on the dollar of that 77 million, right? Or about 47,000 an acre, let's say 48,000, which is much more significant than what the city is getting in property taxes. So I see the benefit of looking at it that way. But combined, the total taxes, retail plus property taxes per acre out of that Walmart is 51,000. And the property taxes of our building per acre is more significant. You add our retail taxes, now you're cooking with gas. Jobs per acre. You know, when you put it side by side, we even have 90 units of residential per acre versus their zero. So the data is there if you just change the filter. You can see what's going on with the information. Jim, does that make sense? So sometimes people ask me, like, Joe, what's your problem, man? Why, why do you hate Walmart? Like, what's your deal? And um, I, I have to own it right now. I, I don't. I honestly don't care. I'm agnostic about this. But I did present at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers. Is the county assessor in here? Um, the assessor's conference is not exactly like exciting. Um, <laughs> it's it's kind of square. But uh, this guy presented. This is the head of Walmart's real estate, and he stood up in front of the audience of 2,000 assessors and went through spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap his buildings were. He's like, our buildings are so cheap. He started handing out business cards. He's like, look, just call us. We will share with you our bid tabs. We beat up our general contractors. We make the cheapest buildings possible. The citizen inside me, that's all I could hear, is we're going to pay the lowest taxes possible. But as a, business, as a businessman, I was like, well, this is kind of brilliant. He's getting all of his tax bills lowered in one meeting. <laughs> Don't hate the player, hate the game, right? So I, I asked them. I went up to the, to the microphone. And I asked, I said, what's, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? 
and he said 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years. We designed that on the depreciation cycle to drive it down to nothing, and we'll build another one that lasts 15 years, and that's our business model. Cool. It's your community. You get to decide with that information if that's good for you or not. Much in the way that I can decide if a pizza is going to be good for me, I like pizza. I just don't eat it every night, right? So these are the things to pay attention to. Now, as you know, the city sits inside a county, so the county is getting something out of you all as well. You all are Wilson County taxpayers, so you're paying a county property tax. My county, we have a not so pleasant relationship with our city or with our county, so we like to show them that um, our county took, got the state to take away our water system, our airport, um, when we s sued them on the water system because they didn't pay us a, a cent for it. Uh, our state legislator called us a cesspool of sin. That was really nice. Um, so we just show them, we're like, look, the average city resident is paying $1,700 in county taxes versus somebody out in the county. That's the truth. That's just, how about a thank you card? We're cool that you have that money. This is the mall. So the mall is paying about $8,000 an acre out in county taxes versus residential. So you see why somebody would do commercial or why you would want to see more commercial in your community versus residential. Those commercial products produce wealth for you. But let's not stop there. Let's go to downtown. This is our building right here at $250,000 in county taxes versus the mall at $8,000. <coughs> so this is you see that what's good for downtown is great for the city but it's unbelievable for the county because we don't have any kids in those buildings and so it's all that wealth going out uh, when, when we call the police the sheriff doesn't show up so it's it's again it's 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 money work with your county and work together you can grow your wealth so I, I just want you to realize this I'm, I'm, I'm setting you up to see your model um, and I'm trying to get you into, into my eyes and the way that I look at cities this isn't complex math it's actually just productivity analysis when we compare cars, we don't compare cars as a miles per tank basis, do we? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank. You'd say to me, Joe, that's silly. We do it on the gallon because all tanks are different sizes and the numbers change. And we should all be driving BMW Assetas at 70 miles per gallon. You know, the land is all that you have to control. And if we're doing this for a $2 commodity, a $3 commodity, shouldn't we be doing it for a $30,000 commodity? So we've done this all across the country. We've done it in Canada, New Zealand. It, it really doesn't matter where you go. When you stack up the whole data set, this is what we see. For every dollar of county taxes, somebody out in the county is paying a single family to the county per acre. A city resident is paying about 550. The Walmart's about seven bucks. The mall's about nine. But as soon as you get to a two-story building, you see a bump. And it's not a, a, a proportional bump to three stories. It's an exponential jump to three stories. And that's a six-story one on the far left right here. And it's just, it's really easy. Just think about it. If you stack dollars, you're, was what you're stacking stories, right? So taking it to the next level, which is if I can map your brain, can I do an economic MRI? Can I show you what's going on with your cash flow or your community? So we use GIS technology, which you all have um, here in your, off in your offices. You have some, like, crazy Jedis with, like, big computer screens upstairs. Um, <laughs> they're really cool guys. Um, but uh, you, can, you can do this stuff. You can see your infrastructure, your buildings are built on your infrastructure. That's your physical side. And you have your, this is really important to you, the hydrology, your geology, right? You all flood because of the rock and, and water, and you have to map that stuff. What we'll do is we'll split the nature and the man-made and see what your cash flow is. So just to go through Asheville for a second, this is the way my community typically sees my county. We have um, non-taxable here. Green is low value, purple is hot, high value. So this is the Biltmore estate right here. This is uh, uh, William Cecil, is the heir to the Vanderbilt fortune. He has a $100 million house, right? Very valuable property. So when he shows up at a council meeting, we all genuflect and thank him for his time. It's a $100 million house. But it's not fair because it's on 4,000 acres and it's also the biggest house in the entire country. So it's not, he's got the biggest gas tank, basically. So rather than total value, let's go value per acre. And now you see the map change. Oh, by the way, this is a big federal park right here, so it's grayed out. It's just to be cold, parks don't pay taxes, we don't care about them, right? But if you look at this community in 3D, does anybody want to take a guess where my downtown is? You know, so you can see it shoot off the map. If we are to just throw the county's millage rate across this like a blanket, what's, what's supporting the wealth of my county? 
that big spike in the center. And if this is mama bear, if, the, if my city is, is mama bear, we can see our, our little baby bear sister out here in Black Mountain has a similar form where you can see its Main Street popping up. You know, it's 10 miles away from my city. And we could, let's just let the model inform you, right? So you all, um, this is your county at a miles per tank basis. And again, same register of values. You've got your park down here. This is the Cedars Park. Um, it uh, grayed out. You've got some hot value in these large properties along I-40 here. But again, that's the biggest gas tank. So rather than total value, this is value per acre. Now all of a sudden you can see the cities pop up with some heat on them. Um, and then this is you in 3D. Um, you can, when I look at this model, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing different things registering. I'll, I'll get to um, Mount Juliet in a second, but Mount Juliet's like this kind of tidal wave stretching out from, tennis, from, uh, from Nashville. It's got some purples, but you all can see your downtown here in purple. Um, Watertown is probably more of the normal um, profile that we typically see, where you see a, a large spike pop up into its downtown. And I think the difference between your downtown and their downtown is just a matter of the fact that they've renovated more of theirs than what you have. So you see that your purple spike should have been higher, basically. Um, this is a side view, and you could really see the profile of Watertown as a mountain range. And your downtown should be up here somewhere, but it's not. But you're still getting some heat out of that downtown. Um, does, it, does that make sense? Um, so your city is a, is a per tank or total value, and then value per acre. And again, you see that spine of value along your commercial corridors. Um, and then here you are in 3D. Your hospital does quite, quite well. They don't, we don't tax hospitals in North Carolina, which um, I think you should hang on to that. Um, our hospital is a big land hog, just kind of consuming most of our community at this point. Uh, but you're starting to see some heat in, um, in different residential types that are coming out at a higher potency than others. Um, and we could learn from that. So I just tend to look at this like, a, like an x-ray. What do you see? What's it telling you? Why is one doing one thing and one's not doing it the other? Um, and how do you learn from that? So your core of your downtown, um, the, the, you, see the, you see the heat and the purple around the square, where those purple spikes come from. Taxable, non-taxable, your county's at 4% non-taxable. That's actually on the low side. We typically see it around 12%, um, somewhere in the low teens. Um, but again, that tax, the non-taxable stuff doesn't pay taxes, obviously. Your city's at about uh, 9%. We just did uh, Pueblo, Colorado last week, and they were at like 40% uh, non-taxable because of some universities and, um, and stuff. And then your downtown is at 23%. That, again, that's on the low end. Asheville, we're at 44% non-taxable because we're a county seat. Um, and we have uh, a lot of churches and stuff in the downtown. Um, you can see there's a big cluster of non-taxable right here. That you all know this, but for us, we're just, that's the data. Um, typically, our recommendation is to try to put that stuff on a diet or use it in a good way. Um, but just be aware that it's, this is where your fertile soil is for cultivating the most wealth, and when you lose that opportunity, you don't get taxes out of it. Um, so just as a comparison, your city is about 6% of the land area of the county, but produces 21% of the property value of the county. So when the county looks at its, how it's, where, where its property taxes and where they come from, you all produce 21% of it, which is pretty good. If you want to think of it from a ratio standpoint, it's like a 1 to 3.5 ratio of productivity for every square foot or square acre of land that you have in the city is producing 3.5 times its potency at the county level. When you get into the downtown in the city, the downtown takes up 0.44% of the city, yet it's producing 2% of the city's wealth, which is a 1 to 4.5 value of, pro of productivity. Um, so that's getting better. And then also the downtown's paying county taxes too. It's 0.03% of the county's land area, but it's producing 0.43% of the county's uh, property taxes. Now that may not look like big numbers, but it actually is a 1 to 14 ratio of potency. Um, does, does that make sense? Think of, it, think of it as you have a staff of 100 people, and one person is doing 14% of the, uh, the sales on the sales floor. You know, how would you reward that person? Um, that's good productivity. So 
why things are productive um, comes down to buildings. Uh, we tend to think of subsidies as you come to a council meeting, you give somebody a zoning bonus or something like that, but just how our tax system is set up builds a subsidy into the, into the model. Um, parking is typically valued a lot less than buildings. So pound for pound, when you put your tax bill on that, I pay less for that lower improved value of having a big parking lot. So when we look at this land, it all comes down to how the land is used. It affects how the model looks. So one of the reasons why um, the, your commercial <coughs> corridor doesn't really come out that well comes down to the amount of space that's dedicated to parking versus buildings. This is um, uh, taking um, Providence and putting it side by side with your downtown. So your downtown has a much more splintered uh, parking space. A lot of it's used on street and not necessarily um, in the belly, but you can see that you're getting a lot of heat purple stuff out of your core on the east side of your, 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 your square. Um, just to run through some buildings, your Walmart's averaging about $775,000 of value per acre, which is less than your Kmart. Um, the Kmart, we, Paul and I were talking about this earlier, it's probably because of the out parcels in the Kmart driving the value up. We typically see the Kmart's at about half the value of a Walmart. Um, but we, we'll use your Walmart as a control subject, and I'll keep it down here in the lower right. Your Kroger's about 764, which is less than the Walmart. Your Big Lots is 692 per acre, 692,000. Um, your Home Depot is about 492,000 <laughs> per acre. There's a big car lot thing that I guess they just store cars there or something. I don't know what to call that thing. It's only $100,000 an acre of value. Um, which is actually less than a single family home in your community of, of taxable value. Um, this was kind of interesting. Your outlet mall is about $560,000 of value per acre, and Providence Marketplace is coming in at about 582000 So your outlet mall is actually almost as much value as Providence Mall. Now, who would have thought that when you drive by either of them? Right? So a lot of this is letting go of we have implicit biases when we look at things, and then there's data. So um, incidentally, both of those are worth less than the Walmart. That's another way of looking at it. Um, so when you get into the, the, there's a strip over by the Sonic on West Main. This is a million dollars of value per acre. So this is almost double Providence and property tax productivity. Your Sonic on Main Street's almost three times the property tax productivity of Providence. Um, you might want to go give them a hug or something. Uh, I, I, I built that one. Oh, you did? All right. Top well, give yourself a hug. Um, your Burger King, I hate to say it, it's actually not so bad at 1.2 million. It's kind of sad. But we'll compare it to the downtown. Um, you know, it's, you know this. This is your history. This is, this is who you are. This is, the, this is the place you know. It's on a postcard from the 1920s. This is the core of your city. Um, those buildings that are still here, and again, that, that Burger King was, what was it, 1.2 million? Yeah. This block is averaging about 6 million of value per acre. So, and it's in various states of rehab, right? Um, the Lowry, Lowry and Cherry building is 6.3 million. It's called 6.4 million. The chamber's coming in around 5.2 million. And then you have this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know whose this is, but this is... <laughs> Hopefully you're not, just, if you're in the room, fix. Well, uh, mine's the glass. <laughs> mine's the glass one. We need, to, we need to get a hold of this guy and tell him to do something. Because right next door, that's $5 million of value per acre. So why are these buildings sitting here? How do you make them? How do you, what, are the, what are the questions you want to ask? Maybe we do this tomorrow at the, the downtown organization. What's, what's in the way? of? Is it building codes? Is it, um, is it a strategic plan? I don't know. But there's this great quote from Andreas Duani that he likes to use. It's, when the revolution happens, where would you go? And I was just Googling old pictures of your square, and there's, here you are sending off your troops to World War I. It's obvious where you go. You go to your square. You have one. You know, we're, Paul and I were talking. We're like, well, what, what, where would you go on Mount Juliet? You know, where, where's, where, do you, where do you hang out? Like, what, where do people? Yeah. <laughs> we just wander around the Target parking lot. Like, so... Um, this is, uh, I can go through this whole thing, but basically these are, we call this the usual suspects. So looking at 
the, uh, the taxable value per acre of each of these things. This is the auto auction area. So these are all basically the same numbers we went through just now, but as a chart. Your downtown, um, the, the not rehabilitated, I guess this would be the mayor's property. Um, it's still doing all right, is a non-rehab building, but it could actually bump up to five million in, in value. Um, usually what we see in downtown situations is more begets more, that once the re rehab starts happening, it starts to accelerate in value. Um, but uh, to give you an, an idea of indications of what you can learn inside your own county, um, this is Wilson Bank and Trust at 2.6 million per acre. Let's call it 2.7 million. Um, this is Wilson Bank and Trust at 6.7 million. Um, you know, almost three times the productivity in Watertown versus what you have. And again, that's all due to how that building is shaped on the site, the number of stories, and how it maximizes its land. Um, there's trade-offs to that, you know, basically. But just be aware of what you're losing as a tax productivity when you stretch things out. And you still have to pay for the pipes of all that. So basically, two acres of this little, little guy right here would equal the 18-acre big lot, apples to apples. Um, 4.1 acres of the uh, Lowry, Lowry, and Cherry building would equal the 33-acre Walmart. Um, retail sales, we had some fun with retail sales. Retail sales are significant in the state of Tennessee. This is a, state, this is the, a, a chart of all the states across the country and how they're funded at a municipal level. So when we say municipal, we're looping, loop, lumping you and the county together because this is all your community, right? Your brothers and sisters together. Um, if you're on the right side of this chart, green is retail taxes. So retail taxes are more important to y'all on the right-hand side. Uh, if you, but you generally don't want to be in Alabama or Arkansas where there's a lot of retail sales that run the city because when you run out of, when people are out of work, they spend less money, you all of a sudden can't afford your city. Um, but uh, in trying to get your retail tax data, we got this lovely letter from uh, the attorney at the revenue office uh, respectfully declining to give us information, um, but, but Paul's on it. I'm maybe a little bit more upset about it uh, because we get retail tax data all the time. We got it in Texas, uh, at Austin. We got it and modeled it in Syracuse, New York. And we even went so far away to this place called Nashville and got it for Nashville. So clearly we can get it. It's just, anyway, I'll stop. Um, so just to show you how the retail taxes would model, we want to see it and how, it tie, how we can tie it to the urban form. Uh, this is Durango, Colorado. Here's downtown Durango's uh, property tax model, modeled as a district. So you can see downtown. South Durango is their, uh, their version of, of Providence. It's their, their Walmart, their mall, et cetera. This is their retail tax productivity. So we're able to see that their retail in their downtown was killing it. Now, their downtown is much more established than yours, uh, but we could model it. Let me just kind of jump ahead. You know, we, hope to, we hope to have that model for you. Um, there are lots of things you can learn about Mount Juliet or learn from Mount Juliet. Um, one of the things that was kind of, when you look at their model, you're going to see that this housing, so here's the, the target and the whole marketplace, right? You're going to see this housing come up red. It's actually very productive. But what's missing is that the connection to the retail. Um, if you lived in this unit right here, you're literally 50 yards from the target, but you can't walk there. So it's actually, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, if you're building a, a mixed urban environment, you kind of want to have that other part of the indicator species, the ability to walk or bicycle somewhere. Um, now, the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this to you is that there's, we saw this in Gwinnett County. Um, we did the analysis in Gwinnett County, and they told us, they're like, look, we're rural people in Gwinnett County. I don't, do you all know Gwinnett County? I was under strict <laughs> orders to not use the word urban, city, town, or municipal in my presentation. And they said, we're rural. Those are offensive words, which was really hard when your company's named Urban 3 to do this. <laughs> but um, here's Gwinnett County out here and here's Atlanta. So they said, we're not Atlanta people, we're not urban people, we're out here in Gwinnett County. And we, when we pulled their data, Gwinnett County is 800,000 people in their county. And I called my client, she's like, yeah, but honey, you gotta understand, we're 460 square miles, we're a big county, all right? So when you divide 800,000 people into 460 square miles, the density is 1,900 people per square mile. 
which is less than DeKalb, but it's more than all these other places. So when I was presenting to them, I asked them, I said, what's in Mecklenburg, North Carolina? And they said, Charlotte. I said, how did you guys get denser than Mecklenburg and Davidson? You didn't produce a Charlotte or a Nashville. Both of these places have football teams. Gwinnett doesn't. You know, so it's, it's, it's what we tell ourselves, and then there's the data. Um, this is Austin, Texas. They're double the density of Austin, Texas, Raleigh. This is my town of Asheville. And this is what rural looks like. This is Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So what they did is they kept their face firmly in the ground for 20 years as growth just shot past them. When we did their model, um, this is how it looked. It was like a, a big yellow map. And I got Josh to turn it on its side, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a 1970s shag carpet. You know, it's just the same thing all across the whole way. They basically developed the entire county with a monolithic form of development. You're seeing this in, in Juliet. This is not Juliet. This is the reason why I'm bringing this forward is that they're unconsciously following these failures without going to just go to drive to Gwinnett County and just say, what, did you, what would you do differently? You know, they're in a really tough situation right now. This is what we typically see. And you saw the same in your community or even in Watertown where you start to. You can see there's three municipalities here, and you can see their main streets in the model. The model and the economics will show you what's going on, and this is some new urbanism over here. But I can see Main Street, Main Street, Main Street. This is what they got. So they essentially put all their furniture in the room, and now they have to put their carpeting in. It's going to be an expensive endeavor. Um, so to look at your, your situation to Nashville, there is a strong parallel to this, that y'all are out here in Wilson County, and here's Nashville. You're umbilically connected to this place. It's where your jobs are, and how, what's your relationship to it, because they had that opportunity in Gwinnett County with their connection to Atlanta, and they chose a different path. And you can learn from this, uh, much in the way that I can learn from my dad's lack of exercise, right? Um, so the highest value that Gwinnett County was able to achieve with all of their growth is $8 million of value per acre, which you guys are actually, at $6 million, you're coming close to that. So you're actually in a better spot right now. Um, and all of these places are less dense. So just to rub it in, we put the three counties side by side by side and ran an economic heart monitor to show them the wealth that they've created. So Nashville peaks out at 192, 192 million. Austin <coughs> peaks out at 476, and they're flatlining at eight. And there are 800,000 people in that community. So they have all that horizontal infrastructure and none of the potency to pay for it. So. As you look at this, as you see this heat effect of what's coming off uh, Mount Juliet over here by the lakes, um, it's, it's sort of a mirage. Um, and this is a map of development in your county over time. And you can see how your community in Watertown got started as little villages out here um, in the middle of the county. But look what happens um, once, the, once the 80s happen and Mount Juliet starts to grow. <coughs> It's kind of fun to do, but we'll, we'll leave this with you all so you can play it. Um, so you have this train that they chose not to take in Atlanta that you all have that's an asset sitting right here. Um, we made a jobs map. This is Nashville, and the, the dots are relative to the amount of people that leave this community and where they work. So you actually do have a lot of jobs that stay inside your area in your community uh, in, in Lebanon right here um, versus what goes on in Nashville. Um, we made a jobs model of Wilson County, so you can see the relative density of where they're at. Paul and I were talking about this earlier, trying to figure out which ones are um, the spots. But we can lay that back over a map and pull it out again. But taking your train line is a piece of conduit that runs through this whole thing. Um, this is the side view of the model, and you can see the potency of what happens around downtown is, is maybe a lesson. You're not going to be there doing this tomorrow, but you can do that at a smaller scale. This is you all out here by your train station. You're actually getting some good value there already. So this is like a little transit-oriented cookie cutter that what, what a pedestrian would walk from that train station. And this could be something to see as a leveraged asset opportunity, that you could build more stuff in there. Um, incidentally, we were just in uh, uh, California last week, and we did the exact same thing for them for their train station. They wanted to know if we add buildings in this train station what would happen with our tax base. Um, so they, 
they're way outside of San Francisco. This is Sonoma County. Um, this is their model. Here's their train stations. So just around that core in their downtown, I'll just focus on that one for a second. Um, two projects, a hotel and then a low rise, high density development by the train station. The, the low rise would bring them about $400,000 of new taxes at a density of 60 units an acre per year. Or 25 years, they'd get about $9 million. And that hotel project, if they do it as a high rise, would increase the value of their downtown by 157% in one building. So we did a little model to kind of show how those would grow um, from today to tomorrow, just by inserting, doing strategic investment to grow wealth. Um, I don't, I'm kind of going over on time. Should I keep going or? We still got, we still got a few minutes. Okay. Uh, we did a model of, of pipes in, um, in South Bend. Um, South Bend, Indiana, this is their population in the lower left here. They peaked in population in 1963. That's when they lost Packard and Studebaker to Detroit. Their population dropped and they've kind of flatlined. They stabilized, right? On the right is a model of their pipes growing over time. Um, again, when you're growing a city, you're growing infrastructure, you're putting things into the ground. This isn't the sexy stuff to talk about, um, but you own it, right? You own the pipes. This is, this is kind of right about where their population stops in that red boundary, and they don't add more people. So if you're not adding more taxpayers, if you're not adding more people, how are you gonna pay for all this new infrastructure? Um, this is the people growth, or the pipe growth, indexed against their population, and blue is the pipe. You know, you, you're, you're getting too much pipe per person, and just for fun, we laid it end to end. It'll actually stretch from South Bend, Indiana, to like a block away from our office in Asheville. And we're like, you own it. So we kind of took a look at yours. Um, this is a fun map. In orange is the clay tile pipe. This is stuff that you'll hear from your public works department is, is, is things that have to be rehabbed. It's old stuff, basically. Um, it crumbles, it leaks, all of that stuff. So you have to have a strategy to know how much of that you have to fix. The red dots are all your lift stations. Um, you have, what, 70 lift stations? Or, um, so when you look at that extensive network, though, and you see how much you've stretched out, that's a lot of pipe. So you've kind of stretched yourself over that. Um, we tend to see that as sunk costs, which is kind of a misnomer. It's like some of it just doesn't make any sense efficiently to have. You know, in some cases, we were talking in Lafayette, Louisiana, about developing a revert to dirt strategy. Just there are certain areas that just is never going to be efficient to serve. Um, or there are some areas, like this little core area right here, that's your treatment station. This pipe is, like let's say you're this house right here and you flush your toilet. It all has to travel through this network all this way. So how do you deal with this area that's not served that could be more efficient rather than sending the system elsewhere? And again, these are just things that we just ask these questions of how would you handle this? Um, you know, so when you, when you don't have the Greenway, money for the Greenway, the art teacher, or the dancing traffic cop, although you guys do have a dancing traffic cop, I, I saw. Um, a lot of it's because it's tied up in infrastructure. You know, you need to find a way to make that infrastructure efficient to be able to afford the quality of life stuff. Um, and you're also, be aware you're gonna develop, you're gonna de delve into some weird stuff when you get into this type of analysis. Um, this is one of my favorite examples in Cheyenne, Wyoming. If you take the buildings off the dirt, just throw the buildings away and just look at how the dirt's valued per acre. Um, I was presenting this in Cheyenne, Wyoming and you'd expect the world to look this way. Everybody in the neighborhood has the same dirt value per acre, right? But when I was presenting, I said, what's going on here where this is 15,000 an acre, right there, and then as soon as you cross the street, it jumps up to 35,000. Just by crossing the street in the same zoning category, the land doubles in value. What's up with that? And um, the tax assessor said to me, she goes, you don't understand. And I was like, well, what am I missing? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. Does that make sense to anybody? The more stuff I have, I said, okay, so I've got three miles of infrastructure around this property. This person's got 200 feet. She goes, we don't count infrastructure. I said, I got a bigger building over here. A bigger building means more trips, more, more uh, car accidents, more fire calls, more commerce, more police calls. Do you charge me for any of that? She goes, no. So there's things buried into the system that are standards. And I, and I, asked, and I asked, I'm like, well, how did that happen? And you see this here. This is your value per acre. 
Um, you can see the heat effect of what happens when you have something like a lake. Of course, that lakefront property is going to be worth a lot. The value is going to go up. But when you look at your own community, you start to see some wild anomalies. Um, not so bad of what we've seen elsewhere, but you look in here, and it's not totally flat. You see bumps and peaks. And it's mostly because assessors don't do the analytics with 3D um, software. So realize your tax code wasn't delivered on a tablet. You know, it affects the shape of your city. Um, and question some of the standards. So these aren't, they drive market forces. When we say that there's an invisible hand, it's really not. There's a lot of policies that are tied to it. Um, in Normandy, you're taxed on the footprint of your building. Um, so what people started doing is they started projecting out over the street and it was like a free tax uh, subsidy. In England, you used to be taxed on the number of windows you had for about 100 years until people started boarding up their windows to avoid taxes. In France, anything below your roof line was considered your building, anything above wasn't. So it just reshaped the whole way the city was, was designed based on a tax code. And, and you all have the same thing. That it's, I'll make it real simple. The cheaper and junkier the make, I make the building in your community, the lower the property taxes I pay. It's that simple. You know, it's just if you're taxed on value, there's a perverse incentive for building junk. So if you're not measuring it, you can't manage it. Your city is worth $3.1 billion. Y'all are the board of directors for a $3.1 billion corporation. You're worth more than the Titans and the uh, Predators are about um, uh, 3.9 Titans, actually. Um, your county is worth $14.7 billion, which is about um, 14 Titans. You know, I'm sure the owner of the Titans knows Marcus Mariota's towel bill. I can tell you the cups in my nightclub cost $5 or $0.05 cents a pop. You know, we know this stuff to know the numbers and what we can stay profitable. And I hope you enjoy the math. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so that's that's uh, the presentation for today. The work session. Thanks for coming. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Joseph will be here until uh, Thursday, so we'll have some more time to, to talk about. Sorry, I didn't know it was your property. Just grabbed it. Not much. Oh, oh. <laughs>